amazing but true podcast new york post jake brown nelson figueroa a somber tone to my voice today figgy it's been a few months since the last episode episode 187 which was at the queen's baseball convention back in december so it's been over three months since you've heard from me and figgy together again and you know figgy unfortunately i have here to report that at least on the New York Post platform and with the name Amazing But True, this will be the finale. It's come to an end. Uh, the New York Post has decided to not bring back the Amazing But True podcast for a season five. Obviously, we both agree it is the wrong decision. It is a bad decision, but that's all I could say because they still pay my rent and I can't say <laughs> anything else bad. Uh, so I will not, I will take the high road and say this that. Uh, I, I cried when my boss told me after, after we got off the meeting, I was emotional. Uh, this has been, you know, a big part of our lives the last four years, 187 episodes. That is a lot of ranting and raving about the Mets and we've had a good run. We did live shows. We did the QBC, you know, we met fans out. We met fans at games. We met fans, you know, throughout the stadium. You know, sometimes in the streets, sometimes you're at coffee. They see the shirt. Who's that? Now you wear the shirt. It's like they're scanning an episode that's months old. Like, what are you <laughs> scanning? They can't scan our backs anymore for the QR code. Uh, so, yeah. So, you know, I I met you, what is it, nine, ten years ago at CBS. Had you in studio. Had a good time. Had a good relationship. This opened up week before COVID. We launched, Figgy. 2020, episode one, Edgardo Alfonso. We were in studio then, and you know that was before all videos were posted and videos became a big thing. A weekend, COVID happens. We do six episodes, go to July, and now it has come to an end, and it sucks, man. It's it's sad. The one silver lining we can look at it is that the Mets are not going to be very good this year. So <laughs> the pain of uh, you know having to talk about it will be good, and maybe we're together in some capacity. Stay tuned for that. Um, but I'll, I'll, we'll keep going, but I'll let you talk here, but yeah, I'm, I'm sad about this. It sucks. I love doing it, but there's, you know, people are going to say what happened, why financial There's change in the industry. You know, it's in a very oversaturated space. There's a million Mets podcast. One of the Mets shows last year, you know, they stopped for a while, financial reasons, business reasons. The business is just changing and the local team podcast don't work as well and bring these companies money as they were before. So I'll say what I'm going to do, what you're going to do, but um, I'll let you talk now. Cause I've been talking enough. <laughs> what new? Uh, no, listen, when we first started this endeavor um, since day one, um, I thought it was going to be exciting. It's going to be different. Um, the way that we bounce off each other, the way that we work with each other, the way that you bring the uh, diehard fan element. You see things from a multitude of perspectives that I never had to think of. And at the same time, I'm able to bring to light, you know, some things that you maybe never saw um, before inside the game. And I think that's what made us so unique. It wasn't just two fans ranting and usually sharing the same voice. Um, you know, we we are free to express our opinions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you go back to our episodes and no one has paid us to send a certain message. Um, we were never told, don't say that. We were never told, hey, watch yourself. We uh, were able to do what we wanted. And I thank the New York Post for that. Um, they gave us an opportunity. And especially for me, you guys gave me an opportunity when nobody else did. So, yeah, that part is is sad, of course. Um, you never want to see a good thing come to an end. But cry let it out no it's not even a cry thing dude it, it is it is it's happy it, 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 there's so much joy that we got from this weekly and it never got to fruition it, it reminds me of my career i wish i had the opportunity to do this the right way with you i wish we had the two days a week um you know with all the video elements that we could have done with the social media everything oh, there was a way to make this thing above and beyond anyone else's and i was prepared to try and get it to that level um this season uh it just it, it sucks that it's going going to end here today however like you said i think we will find a way to uh put our minds together and our talents together and and uh, create another opportunity elsewhere and so for the fans who enjoy our rants our raves our explanations our um you know our shared 
happiness and you know uh, our, our disappointments. I, I think uh, this isn't the last you're going to hear from Nelson Figueroa and Jake Brown. Yeah, we hope not. You know, unless I one of us dies or something, unless I get hit by a bus. <laughs> I, at this point, I'm I'm almost at the hit me with the bus just so I can get money from it or something. It's not like a cartoon, dude. You don't just come back in the next clip. I know. Don't I, try it. It's yeah, I know. Don't try this at home, kids. Uh, don't get hit by a bus at home or in, <laughs> in your local streets. Um, but yeah, it's tough. And you know, I've always kind of been with a platform personally. Always, uh, you know, I started. I was WGBB where I paid for airtime just to be on the radio in Long Island. Uh, ESPN Radio New Hampshire where we were paying each week to be on the air. Uh, CBS. I did podcasts. Podcast with C. I just had a Mike Tyson list list moment. Like he, his new fight. I guess I'm in Jake Paul, Jake Brown. Uh, there will be no future fights in, in my. You know, I, I'm a softie here. I'm trying not to cry because I cry over American Idol clips. Because American Idol, what they do is they tell you this guy got hit by a bus three times. He lost his voice, <laughs> came back to life, and now he sounds like an angel or her. And I'm like, how am I not going to cry? Or their their parents died of cancer and they raised themselves and raised their how am I not gonna cry? Uh I'm just a softy. So I, I cry at YouTube clips and hopefully you cry and, and sing and rant with us down the road. You know, I've always been with someone, like I was saying, CBS, you know, New York Post. For once, I'm gonna do something on my own. I'm gonna do my own YouTube. I'm way behind. I watch so much YouTube every day. I'm on YouTube and I I, I never did. I was never on the video editing side. I wasn't good with that. And you know, the time and I've always been working full time or doing multiple jobs or out and about where I wasn't focused on my own brand and doing something. And I think I'm talented enough and I'm good enough, no matter what someone may say, or they don't like me or they don't want me in a show. I'm going to try and do my own thing. And, you know, we will still do stuff, but on my own YouTube, I'm going to start building that up. I never did it. And I'm going to try this year. I'm going to do Mets rants on there. I'm going to do plenty of Mets lifestyle content everything and you know if you've hung out with me and you know me on the outside you know i'm an entertaining individual and i you know me unleashed is entertaining and in some ways we're on a leash when you're with the company there's certain things you can't say and can't do so please subscribe to my youtube for now i'll still be doing stuff and i think we should do a once a month figgy reunion mm -hmm. we can't call it amazing but true for legal reasons i was thinking can i add a g to it and make it amazing and see if they come after me for that. But I'm not going to mess with the legal system and I'm not going to mess with the company that's still, you know, paying me. I will still be the executive producer of sports podcast there. I'm producing up in the blue seas range of the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. And there could be a new podcast, a new video show in the works with them, not New York Mets, but maybe there is something. So stay tuned for that. But youtube.com slash at Jake Brown radio, the at icon Jake Brown radio. Subscribe there. I'll be doing stuff. I'm going to try. You know, I need to figure out the aesthetics, the better backdrop and all that, because this is like there's a lot of blank space. <laughs> I got to get rid of, you know, Maya gave to the, me to this uh, after episode one. And I, I don't know if I should take it down from my room or leave it for memory's sake. I took hey, down hey, hey. You, all those guys have great backgrounds with stuff from their past. The Wu-Tang albums in the back. You take down the Wu-Tang album. This Put is, that back yeah. up. This is our album. Oh, we, I'm not Bob the Builder, so it might fall down. I the thing above me has already fallen while we recorded. How I did times? take down the the newspaper clipping uh, for yeah. obvious reasons, and uh, I did take down the picture of us. But I will keep uh, this up. I'm not going to be able to get it back up, but you you get the idea. So I'll figure out the back jobs. But yeah, I'm going to do my own figgy. You can still catch Monday to Friday, New York Sports Nation nightly, seven to seven thirty p.m. on Picks Eleven. So stay tuned to that. Maybe we'll be doing something down the road. So stay tuned for that. You know, still follow us at Amazing But True. Um, I'll probably post some of my stuff there. If we do stuff together, I'll post yep. there at Jake Brown Radio at Figgy NY on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it now. But you know, thanks so much to the fans, the listeners. You know, I'm not gonna go through diehard fans, but you know who you are. We appreciate the tweets, you know, the listens again. So many tweets lately. When's the next episode? When's the next episode? Well, here's the next and last episode. That's why I kind of haven't responded. I found out about a week or two ago and, uh, you know, I've been pretty down about it. I'm not going to lie. I've been pretty sad about it. Trying to figure out the next steps. Glad to still be employed. I think it's a very tough time in the business to try to find a job. So I'm glad to still have a job, but obviously an incredibly frustrating time as opening day approaches, you know, I'll be there. Are you you going with uh, picks to the home opener? Yeah, yeah, I'll All be right. at the home opener. We're doing a uh, special. Picks is doing a special um, uh, about the Mets uh, 
season upcoming season so look for that that's going to be broadcasted i believe the night before at 7 30 after our show and then in the morning at about 10 30 they're going to uh, reshow the episode of our special me and marisol castro uh, filmed it yesterday all around city field so uh yeah listen jake it was um it could have been over before it even started right episode one and then next thing you know we're in lockdown um we we had the best of the best guests um from you know former players managers um uh, super fans uh you know you you say it'd be hard to list everyone who is we run we've come in contact to and that have said man i love your show you guys are awesome um it was a, a fun ride to be able to do it um in this capacity and i think i i still see uh, there's a way that we'll be able to do things in the future in a bigger and better way this was a great learning experience all the way around i mean we didn't know what to expect honestly and as this um market and this uh, this forum is oversaturated um you know you just kind of have to make your own lane and i absolutely am supportive of you and i'm behind you 100 that you are you know, jumping into this thing and, and realizing that there is more inside of you that you can get out and then do this thing in a, in a bigger way that we don't have to rely on the New York Post for. Yeah. And I think a lot of times I'm thinking, oh, it's good to have the brand and you get the views behind it, but I'll just battle through the the 30 view videos, you know, the 40 views, you know, our first year posting this show that most of them were not getting listens. They kind of grew as their YouTube page grown. And, you know, I'll go back to where I started. When I started at WGBB, the signal barely reached outside the studio. It was crap. <laughs> I had a one creepy random caller from Indianapolis. I forget his name, but I'm like, why are you listening to West Babylon, New York radio? But I was like, you know what? We got that one diehard wacko listening to the show, and I appreciate that. So I was going through shows to get four listens. So now let's see. And if you don't want to go there and watch, don't. But it'll be entertaining. It'll be good. We're st I'm still going to recap the Mets. I'll still be at the games. I will be cutting back my games. I will say with, with this news, I will cut back. You won't be seeing this shirt out and about a uh, word, more normal clothing. Maybe, uh, maybe what do you I won't consider be normal recognizable, just a normal old Mets shirt. You know, I'll still wear my <laughs> TJ Maxx chain that, uh, I've been rocking. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't turned green yet. Yeah, no, that one hasn't changed colors. Yeah, I'm giving a few more weeks. I've had it since Thanksgiving, so it's probably hitting its time where it might change colors. But uh, yeah, you know, I'll probably be a little bit more tame in the fashion department, um, but it'll be fun. You know, I'll still be there. The tradition will continue with my dad next week at the home opener. So we'll have to run into you, get a pick at mm -hmm. the home opener. Um, you know, that is always, it's going to be great to be at the ballpark, but it, it will be weird not having the show to react to, but I'm glad to still be doing something in some capacity. And I will do every few weeks with Dexter Henry on Sundays. I'll be do a YouTube segment with him. Uh, so stay tuned there, but again, youtube.com slash at Jake Brown radio. And like you said, thanks to all the guests. We had Pete Alonzo on, we've had David Wright on, we've had Ed Cranepool, doc Gooden, Daryl strawberry, Frank, the tank. I'm just going the recent episode, Anthony Rivera, Jim Duquette, uh, Mark Luino, Giraffe Neck, Mark, my buddy, who is helping me in this YouTube landscape because he's a YouTube star and kind of teaching me use this, you know, use your phone, not the webcam video. I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, Lucy Bird, Nick LaRusso, uh, David Brody. I, I, I can't go through everyone. We'll be here all day. Cosell, mm -hmm. everyone who came on, we appreciate it. Um, thank you, Donovan Mitchell. We had Glenn Close, for Christ's sake. Glenn Close. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know Hank about Azaria. these older ones because they were the first year. Hank Azaria, first year or two, and a lot of them were phones. So Glenn Close was over the phone, so you didn't see it. So we had the stars of the stars, Jolly Olive, Rajay Davis, uh, Big Zoo, Clem, Benny Agbayani. Uh, if you want to reminisce and go back, go listen to those old episodes. They'll be as good in time. But if you want to join us in the future, again, Pix11 and YouTube.com slash at Jake Brown Radio. We, you know, we could go all day about thank yous and everything, but, you know, we should at least talk about the team this season for a finale. I think people want for one last hurrah here on Amazing But True. You know, part of me is like getting more comfortable with what I'm going to see. And that is an 80 to 85 win team, Figgy. I just think you have to set your expectations for this team. And the Mets are even letting you know. I mean, Steve Cohen is saying, we understand your expectations are low and we're going to surprise people. 
Surprising people is probably over 500 and competing for a wild card spot. The Mets will not win 100 games. They will not win 95. If they win 90, it means everyone performed at their absolute best and Senga came back by Memorial Day. That's the ultimate highest of the high. You have to be high to think (laughs) that they get to 90 wins. But it's part of me is fine with it because now I realize if they lose, it's a close game, they lose. I expect it. And the last couple of years, our expectations were so sky high. The Mets are at least telling us, hey, we're going to see the young guys. We're going to see, you know, the Acunas later, Jet Williams, Gilberts. We might see them after the trade deadline, maybe before. You might see a lot of Mark Vientos as DH because it doesn't look like J.D. Martinez is going to happen, which I think we all would love that. But with the luxury tax, it doesn't look like it. But we go into this season thinking the 2024 Mets are a, let's prove the doubters wrong kind of team and hope you maybe sneak into a wild card spot. But if not play hard, play for the fans, you know, play to the final out, get the trumpets back. You have Edwin Diaz and let's see that these young guys are actually something because we raved about the trades and these top prospects and, you know, jet or, or um, Gilbert looks like a Lenny Dykstra and we're raving them up. If we're going to see them, let's see what they got. And let's hope for a brighter future because I do think the 2025 Mets will be something uh, we could write home about. But this team's going to be like, let's root hard and hope for the best. Well, you know, one of the things is that we've come to grow into this expectation as, you know, the new ownership group took over and what their plan was. And we knew that they had big, you know, deep pockets and we knew that they went out and got some big names. Even when they got the biggest of names in last year's team, they never even gave it a chance to have all five guys in the rotation, not even one week. And you blew it up before that. Um, To sit back here now in hindsight, and as I always say, I'm never wrong because I get to speak in hindsight, 84 wins is all it took to get to the World Series. For an opportunity to get to the World Series, it was 84 wins. You wound up having 10 less wins, nine less wins, somewhere around that ballpark, but you blew up the team that could have gotten you there. There's only one chance of getting you there, and that was to have that whole team ride it out through the end of the season. And I get it. You look at the minor league farm system, and you say, hey, we've got to get younger. We have to get more talent, especially at the upper levels, because we kept seeing some of the guys that were coming up, and they didn't look like they were going to be able to hack it. We saw guys getting an opportunity, and we knew by June, man, he had a good April, and then May started to come back in the earth, down the earth, and then June, it was like, all right, get rid of this guy. We need somebody else. And that happened over and over, especially with the bullpen, right? When there's no Diaz, you didn't replace Diaz. You didn't re- go out and get a closer-type guy. Robertson was phenomenal, and that was the first domino to fall. When the team felt like if we hit our stride – you know, we got the five guys in the rotation are coming up here. We'll be able to kind of get on a roll here. And next thing you know, wait a minute, you just traded our closer to a rival for 17 year olds. That changed everything in that clubhouse. And there was a disconnect between the GM's message and the team, because every time they went to interview the team, they had no clue what was going on. The GM seemed to have a, a plan and his plan was to take Steve's money and re up in a different way say hey the money's already spent but i can get you back you know pennies on the dollar uh, as we're paying 52 million dollars for verlander to be with the astros but we're going to get back two prospects in, in the deal of those two prospects i think we've cornered the market on guys five nine and shorter so while you look at the yankees on the other side of town and they have jones who's six foot six and swinging a sledgehammer Austin Wells, another guy, a pretty big built catcher. You look at the, the the size of the athlete and the athletic ability of those guys. And I was in spring training walking through the clubhouse and literally all the middle infielders are around the same five, eight, five, nine category. So are we calling it the short King summer at city? Is that, is it, that what it, we got? Well, hopefully not because that means they would already be up in the big leagues. So short what King. I'm, Late summer, early fall. It, 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 yeah, as as the, the leaves start to turn, so too maybe you know uh, it, it's just crazy to me to sit back and say you went out and traded away these major league guys and gave yourself no chance to make the playoffs. I don't care what Fangraph said at the fourteen percent or whatever else it was. I do believe the D backs had something similar to that of a percentage of of what it would take. And they didn't go on a 22 game winning streak, nothing of that magnitude, but you know, they wound up getting in and getting in was enough to say, Hey, you know what? We got a chance at this. We saw that with the Phillies two years ago, 
the Phillies snuck in uh, as the third best team. In the I just division. think the NL is too stacked to give that approach, especially now with uh, with Blake Snell going to the Giants. They just added another frontline starter. There's a lot of teams in this wild card race. I don't think 83 to 85 is going to get it done. I think it's going to be more toward 87, 88. Yeah, but you got to remember that of all these teams are playing each other, they're going to win some, they're going to lose some. Right. If so that they split with all the good, if all the good teams split with each other, because they're not going to dominate each other, they dominate the bad teams. Right. So of all those teams, we, we talk about that with the National League East. How many times have you heard me say rock'em, sock'em robots? We'll see who wins. It's going to be that way yet again. So you can't sit back and predict these hundred win seasons. They don't, they don't come very often, first of all. And even when they do ask the Braves, how that's turned out the last two seasons, they got to the playoffs and then what got punched in the mouth. Never got up off the canvas, had to take a knee and watch everybody else run past them. The Phillies had the same kind of thing, right? They went out, they did, they got the big names, they got everybody, but they they banded together at the right time, got hot and rode that all the way to the World Series. You, you don't take, you don't, I, I, my thing is, why would you not take that chance? We know that this ownership group says that they will do whatever it takes when they get to that juncture. So you get to the trade deadline and where are you at? Well, let's make some trades. Dylan Cease just went for not many, very many prospects. Two guys, right? Two guys over to the Padres. So the Padres finally made a move after trading Juan Soto away. They got back a lot of guys, a lot of arms. And then they were like, you know what? We still need a frontline guy. They went and did it. The Yankees lost Cole and said, ah, we'll be fine. Will they? We don't know. But you only have one year of Soto. You got to go all in. Now back to the Mets. New own, New management with Mendoza being there. Uh, it was like, you know, watching uh, kids in kindergarten, kind of trying to get to know each other, remembering each other's names as they're going around. There's so many coaches, new faces. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot on a manager's plate. But he has really taken to the, I got to get to know my players, not on the baseball field, but, you know, in the clubhouse, open door, people coming into his office. Senga was in his office before he even got back on day one so they could sit and have a conversation. Um, th those kinds of things uh as you're building them now so that when you get during the season because they don't know anything about mendoza mendoza knows i mean he seems like his dissertation on each guy he already has it all mapped out which is impressive in itself while you're the bench coach of the new york yankees you come over to the mets and in three months you've got every person from the lowest of prospect to the, your number one guy is contract situation and you have it all kind of mapped out. That's a lot on a guy's plate. And now you just hope you're hoping to just get a chance to watch them play baseball. And I do think that they're going to play competitive baseball. I do think that they're built to, you know, go toe to toe with a lot of the teams. Do I think that uh, baseball is that one sport that, listen, uh, the starter has a good game, gives you enough depth. You get it over to the bullpen pieces. And we know that bullpen is the back end, at least, of those three. With Rayleigh, uh, Adovino, and and, and uh, Edwin Diaz coming back, you know, that in itself, man, it, that spring training game, I've never seen anything like that. People were high-fiving like it was game seven of the World Series when Edwin Diaz came back. He punches out the side, and it was like, oh, my God, he's back, and, and everybody is rejoiced. They still got to score runs. I get all that, but I do think Francisco Lindor said it best. I don't care if they had us on top or on bottom. We have to figure out who we are. Never has a trumpet has had a big of an impact as Edwin <laughs> Diaz. Like it's one time at band camp. It's like band camp, Edwin Diaz. Those The trumpet brings everyone together. And I do think that was that, actually a flute, but it's okay. What was it? A flute? Yeah. In band camp? What, yeah. What, was that American Pie? What movie? What yeah, movie? American Pie. American Pie, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, flutes and trumpets and clarinets, oh my. Um, I think the Diaz impact is going to be huge. Unfortunately, Drew Smith is still part of that bullpen. We hope he changes, but will. So, I, I, unless I'm mistaken, he still has a zero in spring training. Oh, here we go. This no, 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 is no, no. one no, of my no, biggest. No, no. No, Red no, flag but, is spring training no, statistic and, talk. And, I, and I'll get the only reason I give you that is because last year, no matter who he was facing, whether it was September or in the middle of June or July, his breaking ball disappeared. His fastball disappeared, especially the slider. Every time he threw the slider, you might as well just turn around Hold and get on. a good ball. You might right? as well Hansel Robles Real? it. <laughs> All right. So uh, what, what I, 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 I got to 
talk with them and, and ask about, you know, has he been working on it? Does it look different? Is the shape different to it? The pitching lab is a real thing where these guys are getting the feedback and the digital um, information of the shapes of their pitches when they were at their best and they had swing and miss stuff. Why is my slider now flattening out? Oh, it's because I'm doing X, Y, and Z. Now they have a way to work on it. So far, so good. I've watched him in spring training and he's looked a lot more comfortable with it. He doesn't look like he's trying to overthrow a breaking ball. Instead, he's trying to overspin a breaking ball, which is giving it time to break and it's getting better results. Not saying that, oh my God, he's got a zero and it's great. It always takes just that one time. I want to see him get knocked around and see what he does, see what he goes to. Uh, you know, Bickford on the other side has been just rearing back trying to show that he can throw 98 and he's been getting hit around a little bit. So I, I, I think there's I'm not saying that Drew Smith is now refound himself, but I'm not counting on Drew Smith like we heard last year. Oh, he's going to be a big piece for us. You haven't heard that. They keep saying everybody has a chance to be a big piece, but you've got to earn it. Last year, Drew Smith was just given that opportunity. And he's been around long enough that it's time. Like, it's time we see the consistency out of Drew Smith. And if not, you move on from him. But this is the big year for him in a bullpen that is, it's a cavalcade of, like, random pitchers. Like, outside of, you know, the Diaz, Adovino, Raley, it's a bit randomized with Tonkin and Lopez and Bickford. And Deakman could be good. You know, now you have two lefties, which I think it will be fascinating to watch out of this bullpen and how Mendoza will use Brooks Raley and Jake Deakman. So, you know, and listen, Fujinama is, you don't know what you're going to get. He's a cannonball. He could walk the yard or he could strike <laughs> out the yard. So he's going to be a fascinating watch out of this bullpen. But if you want to talk about a ceiling, I think if, the, if these guys perform, the ceiling of this bullpen is, is pretty nice. You know, you can be comfortable giving the ball to some of these guys. But then there's the other side of it. Can Fujinara walk the yard? Does Drew Smith give up home runs left and right? You know, does Adovino let every runner on seal around, steal second, right. steal third? So there's the side of, hey, these guys at their best, you know, Deakman was incredible with mm -hmm. the Rays last year. So at their best, these guys could be a really good bullpen. But if not, this could be a disaster. Yeah, and I think, you know, I was watching down the spring training where uh, Adovino was working on his pickoff move. He was working on varying his times and stuff, he, and he was doing that on his own on a, one of the backfields. So he he realizes that he needs to be better at that, and, and I think, you know, it goes beyond saying that it's not his stuff. It's the, oh, my gosh, somebody's on. He can only throw over two times, and third time's going to be a balk and what that leads to. Um, Jorge Lopez, uh, who was an all-star two years ago for the Baltimore Orioles, He's been throwing the ball fantastic. It looks great. 96, 97, uh, really good slider, really good changeup. He's been, he looked like a, a guy who's refound himself. Um, it was the same thing. So they got a lot of reclamation projects that, you know, they're giving them the confidence and giving them the opportunity to be a part of this bullpen where they're not necessarily the lockdown, only lefty, eighth inning guy, ninth inning guy kind of thing. So they can kind of, you know, get put in situations where they're going to have success. And I like that better than the random three names that they kept calling in the fifth and sixth inning when they took out the starters last year. Right. I can't even remember the guy's name. He had like 32 games for the Mets and he had, he had 32 games for the Mets before the middle of May. And he had 32 games in his career. Bring him. Really. Chef, bring him. Yes. And remember it, it was bring him. Oh my God, this guy's doing so well. And then they put him in big situations and what happened? <laughs> he kept giving it up. Or Grant Hartwig, Jeff, I mean, Hartwig's still on the team, but in the minors, Josh right. Walker all came up, had cups of coffee. We're good. And then got it. Yeah, no. So now you have guys that have had major league success. Um, you have guys that now are going to get an opportunity, the, the first opportunity to do these things. And at least they have a big league pedigree behind them. Deakman watching him throw a bullpen guys, uh, the, the catchers couldn't really frame up the ball. The ball has really late life on it. So whatever he's been working on, and he's always been one of those lefties that can be really nasty on people. So to have those two lefties, you got out of, you know, you got Diaz, you I'm saying Lopez should be one of the other ones. And Fujinama, uh, if he can harness this stuff, I, I still haven't seen the hundred mile an hour fastball. And he says he ha he's not trying to throw hard yet which I, I really can't understand because I always tried to throw hard, but he's not trying to throw hard yet. And he's, he's better saying, off. Listen, Sanga had fatigue after the first pitcher and catcher. <laughs> when, when he met the catcher, he had fatigue. So I don't know what Sanga was doing in the off season that that happened. And look at Garrett Cole. Now both New York aces are out potentially till Memorial day or longer. So I like the Fujinara post, just throw folly floaters now. And then opening day, 
bring the heat bring the heat exactly so i, I he look he has looked uh better with his command he's not walking a lot of people he was able to go out there his first couple of outings and just kind of I, I think they're working on smoothing out his mechanics and getting him to just pound the strike zone and then you know use the the fork ball, his split finger, whichever he calls it, and then his slider. He's been throwing a slider for a first pitch strike. So he looks like, again, you, you got some new eyes on him, some new uh, voices that are getting in his head and saying, hey, let's use your strengths and not worry about your weaknesses. It's going to be an interesting pitching unit. I mean, in start of the Sanga out, I mean, th- no disrespect to Jose Quintana. I actually like him, but this season is summed up by Jose Quintana as your opening day starter. It's a lot of names and guys who have had solid careers but it's not going to jump out of you but listen some of these great teams come playoff time have not like the braves in the past haven't had an elite rotation the orioles like guys you haven't heard of so it could be a ragtag bunch and you know if you want to look at some positivity and maybe it'll be good look at the 2000 mets a very ragtag team didn't have a ton of stars and made the world series i don't think the mets are making the playoffs this year i think this team is around 70 you know my exact prediction I'll say 77 wins. I think they're unfortunately a 77 win team. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not setting my expectations high. And I think that's good for your blood, blood pressure, your triglycerides, <laughs> your, your mental health um, <laughs> to not go into this season thinking they're going to make the playoffs. Cause if they do, you're going to be pleasantly surprised and happy. No matter what happened in the playoffs, you're going to be like, Holy cow. This team made the playoffs, but they got to, you know, Severino goes back to his old ways. Quintana is an innings eater and stays out there. Manaya, you know, has got interesting stuff despite shaving the the hair down a little bit. Um, a lot maybe, of it. Maybe jo- join the ball club, you know, Sean, <laughs> come on down. Uh, Hauser, you know, had a good season last year. Maybe McGill takes that next step and he looks like the ace we saw to replace DeGrom. We'll see on the pitching step. And then offensively, you know, Alvarez is, it's time. Like we saw it for a couple months. He faded down the stretch. You might be the five hitter. This could be a Francisco Alvarez 30, maybe 40 homer season. If he stays out there and all goes right, you know, Pete Alonzo playing for a contract. Jeff McNeil didn't have his best year last year. He's due for a bounce back. Starling Marte healthy due for a bounce back. Brandon Nimmo moves to left field. Maybe that takes some stress off of him playing center. You got Harrison Bader. You got a lockdown center fielder. If he stays healthy, um, DH will see Vientos hitting homers left and right. I don't look at spring stats. Um, and then of course you got Lindor, you got Joey Wendell off the bench. You got Tyrone Taylor off the bench, DJ Stewart bench DH Marte will mix in a little DH when they give him days off. It is an interesting bunch. Narvaez is a backup catcher. I'm fine with it is an interesting offensive bunch. You know, the bottom of the order might struggle, but if they, you know, go back to their great years like they had two years ago, Figgy, a lot of these guys, Mm -hmm. and we see them perform at their best, and we see some of these young guys step up and a Brett Beatty step up. It could be a a fun, intriguing offense to watch, and one that I'd like to see Starling Marte at the top of. I know some Mm -hmm. people will argue this. I would like a base stealer up top because Brandon Nimmo, unless he's going to change this year, doesn't steal enough. I know he walks. I would love to see Marte one, Nimmo two, or you move Nimmo down, some kind of realignment there. But it's going to be an intriguing offense, one that might not jump out to you. But again, if everyone performs right, they could be fun. Um, without a doubt. And I, and I think that's one of the things is that every single player to a man has said, you know, last year was hard from the very beginning. I think there was too much of an onus on pace yourself last year, you know, and then that, you know, we're, we're, we're going for the stretch run. We're not worried about the first couple months. Then June hit and you're like, what is going on? Besides injuries, you had lack of performance. You had guys who were all still hitting in, in the low 200s, and you're wondering what is going on with this team. How are they just sitting back and and you know allowing the, the Braves to get away? That four game uh, the, that four game stretch against the Braves where uh, they got demolished. You know they gave up what was it 20 something runs that one game. It was crazy to see. Um, right then and there was like, that wasn't enough of a wake up call to be like, Hey, we've got to change things around here. We've got to, you know, start, you know, scrap whatever happened the next 70 some odd games, 80 some odd games. We got to kick it in high gear. You know, it's now or never. And and they never got to do that. So I think you look at this year, uh, Marte being fully healthy. I, I, I think he was rushed, um, last year because he as a ball player said, yeah, I can play. But deep down inside, he was more like 
80%, 75%, then he was 100%. And you could see his routes were terrible. It looked like he was lost sometimes, especially when he, after he slid in the third base, he had the neck issue. We saw Rizzo, you know, three months later is, oh, he's got a, now he's got a concussion. He's in the concussion protocol because of, you know, what happened with him and Tati. So uh, things, the players want to play and they're going to try and play through some things. And they know that they're never a hundred percent, but I think Mar Marte speaking with him, he said he feels really, really healthy. He feels really strong. Again, he got to play in winter ball, see some live pitching. And we're not talking about live pitching, like, Oh, spring training, kind of just working through some of the 98 mile an hour Dominicans throwing 94 mile an hour sliders. And they're trying to show off when a major league hitter like Marte steps in there and he was able to, to go there and, and get his timing and, and feel like he's going to be on the ball. Um, Big yeah. X factor for this team. Like him huge, at his best was huge. remarkable two years ago. I mean, that throw, you see that throw that he made earlier in spring against the Cardinals and from right field throughout their uh, leadoff guy um, uh, with, with just an unbelievable cannon from right field. So that even in itself shows you that, you know, he, he he's healthy, he's ready to go. Um, McNeil, I know, is going to be able to hit more towards, you know, he's 270 and everybody's like, oh, he stinks. No, he doesn't stink. He, he's a guy that can easily, you know, hit between 290 and over 300. Um, Pete and, and Lindor have been one of the most potent one-two punches in all of baseball. Um, I asked him that question. He had no idea what I meant. I'm like, you know, you and Lindor, one-two punch, like best two hitters from both – NBA jams, bro. Have you ever played NBA jam? Of that, course, classic. Well, that's how I had to explain it. Take the best two players and you play against the other team. I go, so you guys. They do I things think, different in Florida. You know, they like, they chase alligators <laughs> and do weird things so, there. So it, the, the, what a what a potent uh, one-two punch that they have been. RBI machines, you know, take the batting average out of it. The doubles, home runs, and RBIs, they, they do it, right? That, that, that's something that they have uh, been able to do no matter what, no matter who's in the lineup. Um, Alvarez, yes, getting the nod as a starting catcher as the fourth highest paid catcher on the team right now. Um, Nevarez, a $10 million backup, and he probably okay with that, but he's going to probably, I would see, I would probably see him be somebody's PC where he catch one guy all the time. You know what I mean? And just focus on that one guy. Um, I could see that very, very easily. And, you know, you let Alvarez catch the rest and whether it's lefty, righty, it's not about a matchup with Alvarez. It's about and credit to Alvarez. I mean, learning English like he has, I think mm -hmm. doing interviews in English, because that's not easy. And a lot of people, there'll be clowns out there. But how do they not know English? Blah, blah, blah. But like trying to learn a completely new language, I think for a catcher is, is very important because mm -hmm. the way you can communicate with guys now is a game changer. And I think mm -hmm. he's that's showing his maturity, his growth. And I think defensively, we saw that he's continued to improve and he's worked on his game that I think he's one player on this team. You look at like, you want to talk about improvement and taking that next step to maybe become a star and maybe get that contract that whoever reported it, that it didn't end up happening. Hector yeah. or was it Gomez? Uh, you know, maybe that he does get that contract. That was big for him, and he's a big part of this line. Yeah, I mean, if you go back and you look at um, who's the guy from the Royals that uh, they gave a five-year, seven million dollar deal to, um, they're they're a catcher. Uh, Salvador Perez. Yeah, Salvador Perez. His first deal in the big leagues was a five-year, seven million dollar deal. And all of Major League Baseball, all of the uh, MLBPA were like, what in the hell is this deal? There's no way. But he was a kid from Venezuela who said, wow, they're guaranteeing me five years in the big leagues and $7 million. He took it. Everybody's like, why would he take that? Well, he only had, I think, less than a year in the big leagues at the time. And then they wound up reworking the contract to make him – if he if he was in the upper echelon of catchers, then he would get a bump in salary each time. And they wound up redoing it because the MLBPA went nuts about it. So you're looking at an opportunity to wow a kid with money. How much is it going to take, right? You look at guys like Acuna, guys like Albies. Albies was 30, what was it, 38 million or something like that? And then you turn around the next day and 160 million to uh, Acuna. So and you see the unfortunate stories like what we saw with Mauricio come out where agents and, and managers and guys are taking money from these kids oh, yeah. where they're not making everyone's like, oh, Mauricio's on the Mets. He must be killing it. No, he's I mm -hmm. mean, a lot of these guys probably put themselves in debt and are struggling. And once they see, oh, two million a year. Perfect. I'm good. I'm I'm set. 
where really they're worth more. So it is interesting to watch. Yeah. And, and you, as a organization, you're going to kind of throw out that low ball offer and see what they jump at. You know, you don't have to break the bank, but I think if you give them the security, you give Alvarez the security of say a seven year deal for a hundred million dollars, kind of hard pressed to say no to a guaranteed hundred million. If you blew out your knee tomorrow, you still make that hundred million dollars. Right. And so what if he, what if he breaks out to be that 40 home run guy? What if he, he he becomes the best catcher in the National League and you already have him locked up for seven years? Credit to you for having the the wherewithal and the risk to say, hey, we'll give him a hundred million, see if he takes it. I, I don't see I don't see the harm in that. But I mean, agents are agents. Agents are gonna try and sit back for a while and see what happens. I look at the story of Matt Harvey. Matt Harvey was scheduled to be, you know, the, the highest paid pitcher since the day he came into the big leagues, everybody was just saying, man, they're going to wait till free agency. He's going to sign with the Yankees for over, you know, $200 million. And that's a tragic tale of what could possibly happen. So Alvarez is different though. I do. I did love his swagger walking. So last year was cockiness. And I think that was when you had two hall of fame, older type guys um, seeing Alvarez walk around and kind of strutting his stuff that they felt he was a little too cocky for a rookie. Mm-hmm. And now you see him out there and he's involved. He's talking with everybody. He's actually grabbing Acuna and, and Gilbert. Those guys are saying, hey, what are you doing standing around? Let's go hit extra in the cage. And they immediately run to their lockers, grab a bat, and they want to go hit with Alvarez. Um, so his swagger is different because he knows now his place. He knows how he fits with this team. He knows you know, that he can do it at the major league level. They kept questioning him. They kept saying he wasn't ready to be, you know, a catcher at the major league level. He didn't have the skill set. Um, this Billy Eppinger, you know, the metrics, he hasn't met the metrics of a, what it, we think he should be to be in the big leagues right away to make the team. Pete Alonzo, remember when uh, Billy, Brody Van Wagner said, um, it's now or never for the kid. We're going to put him in the big leagues to see if he can do it. Not triple A to see if he can do it. Alvarez got an opportunity because of other two, two guys getting hurt and then came up and was able to show that he has that kind of power and that kind of uh, ability to rise to the big moments of home runs seventh inning or later to tie games or take leads. You know, that's a special breed. And now I think you're going to see a guy who's going to try and make the most of every opportunity. And when it's not an expectation of where the team to be, be the team that beat everybody. Uh, The Diamondbacks didn't come out of spring training bragging about how good they were. Name the you could name the Diamondbacks rotation. You can name the Texas Rangers rotation without Montgomery and, and Scherzer. Go ahead, I'll wait. Nobody can. So don't talk to me about do they have enough? Uh, is this starting rotation? Can they contend? Listen, if you allow people to go out there as a starter, get out, try to get third time through the lineup so you save the bullpen a little bit. I think we've seen that in the previous years. The bullpen spent by June, spent. You're sitting there going, this guy can't keep working this way. He can't have 72 appearances by the time we get to August. So I think uh, if you can get some of these guys that say, and they're not the hardest of throwers, they're guys that know how to pitch, know how to go deeper in the game, like a Quintana, a guy who got into six and two thirds per start while, you know, when he came back from his injuries, you know, leading the way. McGill seems like he's a different person. I saw him smiling and laughing more than I did all of last year talking to him in spring training as soon as Senga went down we interviewed him and he was like man I, I you know I feel bad for him you know and I'm just gonna go out there and do everything I can to help the team win cameras must, turned must off. be the great American sport ball that he's <laughs> every the cameras turn off and I turned back to him and I said you're smiling a lot more now and he's like I don't know you know it, it just he's like I put too much pressure on myself last year and the end of the season he felt more comfortable as is, that's the way he's capable of pitching and like we said, it's September, you know, you got to go, you literally got to go into every single at bat that he faced. And, you know, was that a major league caliber player? But it's undeniably has major league stuff. We've seen him at the best, you know, sitting there at 98, 99 miles an hour, good breaking ball, good change up. And now the spork, which has gotten a lot of outs and a lot of attention. And the thing with the spork is, and now he gets to two strikes, and even when he shakes his head a couple of times, he doesn't have to throw the spork, but it puts a little bit of doubt in the hitter's head, and his other stuff will still play. So he he seems like a different person. Like the, the, the clubhouse, to me, it was palpable. Like there was uh, – it, 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 people weren't tense just being there. The level of expectation maybe made it tense. The, the, the guys that were supposed to be the leaders made them feel tense 
because there was an expectation of World Series or bust. And not just get to the World Series, but win the World Series or bust. Now they go out there now and it's like, hey, we're here together. This is our first, with all these guys, all the young guys, it's our first time together. You know, let, let's bond on this. Let's see what we can do. Let's let's just cheer each other on. Everybody's in the dugout. That dugout is always, you know, big high fives and smiles and stuff. Not sitting around like, ah, oh, he's supposed to get a hit. You know, he's supposed to, you know, drive in a run. No, uh, like enjoy the game. And I think one of the things I, I said interviewing Carlos Mendoza that was fantastic was I said, I've never had a manager who in his first speech talking about what the there's always expectations. There's, you know, being on time. There's, you know, can't treat everybody the same. Um, he said, have fun. Crazy. I never heard a manager say, have fun playing the game of baseball. It's always been about, you know, uh, handle yourself like a professional, do this, your expectations, this, that, and the other thing. He went out there and spring training said, we're going to go out there. We're going to get the job done and we're going to have fun. Seems simple enough. So. Exactly. Because you got, you have to take that. There's got to be an element of, you know what? We're playing a game and no matter what happened yesterday, we don't win the world series or lose the world series on yesterday's game, especially early in the season, especially in spring training, especially when, you know, you're trying to establish what kind of team you're going to be. He can't even, I, if I said to him today, pick out the lineup and what kind of team are you going to be? Small ball? Are you going to run? Are you going to hit and run? Are you going to uh, just swing for the fences? Or you're looking to, you know, uh, on base percentage? What, what do you want to be? You know what I want to be? A winner. Whatever it takes, however it, it gets done, I want to be a winner. Because that's the most important thing, winning ball games. But they're going to have fun doing it. I told Tommy Hogan, who's on here with us, that we would do like a 15 minute episode, but clearly we have, we have three months of talk As we haven't always. done that this has become an hour marathon. So before we say our goodbyes forever, um, to amazing but true, I said 77 wins, so 77 to 85. What's your what's your Mets win total this season? Somewhere from seven to seven to eighty five. What is it? I said 77 and 85. That's the oh, 77 and 85. Oh, I, I, I think that's 162. I'm gonna make sure my math is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going, oh, I'm taking the over. Uh, I'm I'm going to say that they get to 84 wins, 85 wow. wins, 85. I, Let's go 85. That's I do. Nice. No. I, I just think, I just think that they're, they're, they're going to be competitive. And I do think there's going to be a move made that really helps them somewhere around the, uh, the, the all-star break trading Pete Alonso. <laughs> Tra Pete Alonso getting, will, will getting five sad. players back and uh, getting five players back and then uh, just signing him to a long-term deal afterwards. Uh, again, I just I, hope they're a fun team to watch that we could root for as New York. Cause right now the Knicks and Rangers have been, they've embodied New York and like yes. rooting for New York, like Josh Hart playing 48 minutes, by the way, the, Last player to play 48 minutes for the next Knicks was a guy who I was texting one day, and then the next day they he changed his number, and I was texting again, and it wasn't him. Jared Jeffries. I, I was trying to get Jared Jeffries on our Knicks show, and I was texting him, and a couple days later, some guy that was also from D.C. who knew who Jared Jeffries was answered. It was like, this is not Jared Jeffries. I'm like, Jared, why would you change your number so quick? What did I do? <laughs> uh, so you want a team that embodies New York and is fun of roof because we don't want to go to the ballpark and watch young guys get a hit occasionally. We want to see a team win games. So if mm -hmm. this team wins 85, it doesn't make the playoffs. I think fans will be somewhat satisfied because that's above what Vegas, that's what above everyone else. Me, I'm Mr. Positive. So the fact I'm saying 77 shows you that there is not a lot of hope in this team, but I think 85, even if it doesn't get you in, Fans are going to be happy. With no, remember, 80, 85 is a game and a half a month. A game and a half a month in six months to get you to that 85, right? So I feel like in a game and a half a month, if things break their way, then that changes it from 77 to 85. Do they make in. the playoffs? Do you think they make they sneak in? Uh, you know, again, it's going to come down to, is anybody going to just run away with it? Is anybody just going to, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen it in in that way Severino has looked fantastic I think 
you know, uh, the tipping thing that he has always done is with his head. It's not with his glove or his uh, hands when he breaks them. It's with his head. It's where he looks with a man on second base. Um, if we had another show, I could break it down for you. Um, but Break it down I'll, on I'll the leave, Jake Brown Radio I'll, YouTube I'll, page. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you with that for now. Um, but just watch what he does with his head with men on, men on base, especially in second base. Um, the other thing is that, you know, that's your number three until Senga comes back. And I think he can still pitch to a high level. He's still popping 98 with that fastball. He's changing shapes. Again, pitch lab. He went to driveline. He got, you know, the slow motion video of seeing what his pitches actually do. And he's using his changeup in fastball counts in spring training, which is when you're supposed to do it, to try and test it, to try and work on it, to get comfortable with doing it. So when the season comes, he doesn't have to rely on just his fastball and hard slider to try and get people out, which wasn't working just a year ago. So, I think Severino is a, 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 a going to have a really good season. Um, I, I, I just I just feel like there's an eclectic enough mix, different enough looks. It's not the same thing over and over and over again that can lead to a lot of success. Now, with a first-year manager, when we watched our last two first-time managers, we saw a lot of mistakes, especially early on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw it with Rojas. We saw it with Mickey Calloway, um, you know, we, we don't know what we're going to get right now. Um, hopefully everything is easy and it's cut and dry. But, you know, the immediate when you see some things go wrong, how the media rips apart, uh, you know, when you're behind the steel curtain of the Yankees, uh, those things don't usually get exposed and they get shut down very easily. No matter what Aaron Boone did, you know, by tomorrow, nobody talked about it. And listen, a guy who could change that and will be a big part of this Mets clubhouse that not a lot of people are talking about is a guy you know. That's John Gibbons. He's mm-hmm. going to be the right-hand man for Carlos Mendoza. And when the times get tough, when there's a decision to be made, I would expect Mendoza to look to his right and say, Johnny G. I don't know what he calls him. Johnny G. <laughs> Mr. Gibbons. Mr. G. Gibbons. Mr. G. My uh, Mr. G's the weatherman. Well, yeah. My brother had, uh, I think, a middle school teacher, Mr. G. And... um I think he would do a thing, King Tut, the Funky Tut, and he had a whole dance. He would do King Tut, the Funky Tut. I, I, this is I, my, the ADD medication. I'm just, just about to say. <laughs> I knew the, it. The meds, the meds have not kicked in. You won't def- miss that. You won't miss my <laughs> random tangents, although they are somewhat entertaining. Um, you get that at Jake Brown Radio. I'm thinking of changing to Jake Brown TV and the brand because it's video. I feel like radio you. is a thing of the past. I might have to join the 21st century and change it but we'll see um anyways uh i think gibbons will will be a big factor figgy says 85 and 77 i say 77 and 85 uh price is right rules um so i guess uh let's see if it's 80 if it's 80 i win it's even if it's 84 you win yeah no well i guess it's who's close we'll do who's closer we won't do prizes right we'll do that and we'll bet a steak dinner on it you got it um so there you go there's our final bet to close out Amazing, but true. But yeah, looking forward to it. Opening day, Thursday, March 28th. The Mets take on the Brewers. No giveaways on opening weekend, which is bizarre because it's going to be a little chilly. So getting people to the ballpark might be a little tough. There's not a lot of lore to this opening day. I know the Mets still have a lot of tickets. I know there's their suites open. Like it's going to be interesting. They're going to really have to do dig their hands deep and get dirty <laughs> to try and sell some tickets this year because there is not a lot of hype around this team. So the Mets have to prove it early. They got to go out and win games and say, Hey, maybe they'll surprise us. Um, we got the doc good re- number retirement, April 14th. I got to go to that. That's my yep. dad's birthday actually. Um, so looking forward to doc, we got Daryl, uh, his Jersey retirement on June 1st. So mm-hmm. some fun giveaways. The first Monday game is like a rugby shirt. So I'm curious what that looks like. Again, I'll probably be fat shaming size large. Won't fit me. Even with my hello fresh meals I've been cooking, mm. uh, still won't fit. I've, I've become a chef since our last episode. Like I, I am boy RD. Chef Zaddy Flay Jr. is actually my <laughs> new nickname. So uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the listeners again at Jake Brown radio, youtube.com slash at Jake Brown radio follows on Twitter. New York Sports Nation Nightly, at Amazing But True, at Figgy and Y, at Jake Brown Radio, on X, on Twitter, on Instagram. <clears throat> and uh, this is it, man. It's uh, the Spanish Academy, no more. You know, we'll do a monthly. Again, I'll have Figgy out monthly on the YouTube. Uh, and maybe we'll do a Spanish Academy on there. But we'll say a final goodbye. I'll let you uh, say a goodbye, and we'll close out this uh, finale.
Well, again, to all the friends, family, the support that we've had through the four years, um, it, it's been phenomenal. You know, the, the guys behind the scenes, Andrew Hartz, who, um, you know, helped us with this show and, and just was a tremendous part of it. He didn't make it to the end. He, yeah. he didn't make it to the finale. <laughs> he, pulled, he, pulled, he pulled the ripcord early. He jumped out of the plane before. He's like, let me get the hell out of here. <laughs> no, uh, you, you know, listen, it, it's been a hell of a ride. It was it was a, a lot of fun. Um, I take great pride in the work that we've done and uh, and go back and listen to episodes and point people and fans to episodes whenever they ask questions about, oh, what do you know about it? I got an episode for you. Listen to what what we think about this and and even some of the interviews um i don't think anybody's had a a, a guest list like we have had and you know we're, we're not the mlb network or anybody like that so to get the people that we got um through the years has been fantastic so thank you to all the guests that came on our show um again and i, I have to say this from the bottom of my heart i have to thank the new york post because uh you know i wasn't in the media for a little bit of, for a little time after the SNY debacle. Um, and so they gave me my first opportunity to, to get back uh, in front of a microphone and to get paid to give my opinion. So thanks again to Warren and everybody at the New York post sports. Um, who, and me, cause and I'm the one who, Oh yeah, yeah. I'm no, technically. No. Let, let me get one to, of the decisions. Let me get to my I'm last waiting. goodbye. I'm waiting for and, my salutation. And, the, the and to you, Jake Brown, Thank um, you and mama brown and papa brown and the rest of the family um this has been awesome and uh, i thank you for not just the opportunity but uh continuing to grow with me and you know we have our face on t-shirts and cups and mugs and everything else and it's been um so much fun just every watching games wasn't the same anymore it was can't wait to talk about this can't wait to you know explain this i can't wait to share this and with not just our listeners but with ourselves because this has always been organic like you you have a rundown and there's certain bullet points that we want to get to but man this show can go off the rails really quick if you know if we're feeling passionate about something we ride that wave and we go with it and um you know thank you for allowing me to be me and um I, you know i wish you nothing but success and uh definitely we'll be uh seeing more of each other yeah, got me crying in the club right now. Damn, I'm getting emotional <laughs> here. You know, you, you do what you're passionate about in life. And, you know, I'm passionate about sports and getting behind the mic. And I love the Mets. Like, this is my team. So it's hard to say goodbye. You know, I told you I cried American Idol clips. Now I'm crying here. We'll close it out on that. Thanks for listening to Amazing But True. We'll see you soon. <laughs>